So let's take a break from the neuroscience bit and go back to some strict anatomy. Let's talk about the thoracic wall, lecture 8-1. So in this lecture, there's going to be a lot of discussion about uh, what makes up the thoracic wall, the structure of it, the openings of it, uh, what covers those openings, what goes through those openings. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that. Of course, the thoracic wall uh, protects uh, the uh, visceral organs of the thorax, aids in respiration, uh, attachment point for muscles. No big deal there. There's a superior thoracic aperture, uh, and uh, that's closed off by the suprapleural membranes above the lungs. Actually, a portion of the lungs travels through uh, a pat up superior to the first rib. So a portion of the lung is actually above uh, in your, in, kind of in your neck. Uh, who knew? So, uh, anatomists knew. Uh, then we have an inferior thoracic aperture, which is covered by the diaphragm, of course. And through the diaphragm travels a lot of different important structures, like the aorta. Uh, some other things we'll talk about in a few slides. The superior thoracic aperture uh, is the conduit for all of the structures from the neck to travel down into the visceral uh, body. So, it's a pretty important area. Uh, now, when we look at the wall of the thorax, of course, it's composed of a number of different things, including fascias. So, we're going to name these fascias, and the internal fascia is called the endothoracic fascia. No big deal there. That's easy enough. Uh, so, that is a layer of the deep fascia, and that is the layer that extends over the apex of the lungs uh, to form the suprapleural membrane. So, the suprapleural membrane is a portion of the endothoracic fascia. Uh, now, of course, the wall of the thorax is composed of muscle as well. We have the intercostal muscles. Here we can see we have three different layers. We have an external intercostal, an internal intercostal, and an innermost intercostal, which is composed of three separated bellies, the subcostal belly, the innermost belly, and the transversus thoracis uh, bellies. So these are all connected by a layer of deep investing fascia that surrounds them. Uh, so that's why we call that three different um, bellies. So the important ways to identify these muscles is by their directionality uh, as well as uh, their extent of their muscle bellies. So we see here that the external intercostal, its muscle fibers head superior posteriorly. Uh, you, can't, you can't see me in reference to, but superior posteriorly, so heading toward the back and up, as you can see by these striations in this drawing. We can also see that that muscle belly does not extend all the way to the sternum. So for that reason, there is a, a membrane here, the external intercostal membrane, and so we know that the best place to see external intercostal is at the mid-axillary line or more posteriorly. In order to see the internal intercostal muscle, we're going to have to uh, pierce through the external intercostal and look deep to that at about the mid-axillary line or more anteriorly. These fibers are running uh, superiorly and anteriorly up toward the sternum, toward the sternum. Uh, so uh, that's another way to uh, differentiate these muscles when looking at them. Uh, <clears throat> so it does not extend all the way posteriorly to the uh, vertebrae. Now the innermost, composed of uh, three different subdivisions, uh, this is seen most clearly, of course, from the internal view. Uh, so here the subcostal uh, muscle is at the uh, intersection, the junction, the joint of the vertebrae and the, um, the rib. Uh, so it's in the posterior wall of the thorax. The innermost here on the lateral side, separated from subcostal by some uh, fascia, and then transversus thoracis is attached to the sternum itself, heading just very briefly, uh, inferiorly and laterally. Uh, so uh, we can see here a drawing of transversus thoracis here. Uh, and then we have removed the re we don't see any of the rest of innermost intercostal. So this layer here, uh, we can see its fibers heading superiorly and anteriorly toward the sternum. That is internal intercostal muscle. Uh, okay, so within this orientation, 
we also need to supply uh, all of this, these dermatomes and myotomes uh, via neurovasculature. Segmental nerves and segmental arteries called specifically intercostal uh, nerves and arteries. More specifically, they can be uh, branching uh, as posterior intercostal or anterior intercostal, depending upon their source. Uh, and they will anastomose in the mid-axillary line so that they form one full intercostal uh, nerve artery or vein. Uh, we can see that those features, the neurovasculature, is protected by the ribs because the, the neurovasculature is in the costal groove on the inferior portion of each rib. So these run behind and inferior to every rib. So uh, procedures like thoracocentesis to draw out air or blood or, or fluid that's built up in the parietal cavity. Uh, those are usually performed by palpating for the superior portion of a given rib and injecting there in order to avoid damaging the neurovasculature. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now let's talk about the thoracic aperture. Uh, thoracic aperture is a conduit uh, closed off by the uh, suprapleural membranes. And within this, we're going to see a lot of these structures we've seen in the neck, and we're going to see how they travel down into the thorax. So I'll go quickly through these slides. Of course, there's a trachea and esophagus. You can look at these more slowly because you have the copies. Uh, the brachiocephalic artery on the right side, as well as the uh, carotid and subclavians branching from it or originating on the left side. Uh, we have the uh, uh, the uh, various branches of the subclavian artery you see here internal thoracic artery is going to travel down on either side of the sternum and supply the anterior portions of the anterior thoracic wall. And it's also going to give off some important branches around the heart that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, veins in this region, so clavian and jugular. Thoracic duct is part of the lymphatic system of the body. So on the uh, left side of the body, we have the thoracic duct. On the right side, we have a much smaller lymphatic vessel called the lymphatic duct, which will uh, eventually join up with the thoracic duct in the posterior wall of the thoracic cavity. So the lymphatic duct ex is, is, so right now we're just seeing this portion of the thoracic duct where it's draining into, uh, returning to the uh, subclavian vein on the left side. But the thoracic duct extends up and down the left side of the thorax internally on the posterior wall. <clears throat> so the thoracic duct actually drains the entire left side of the body as well as both lower limbs. The lymphatic duct is going to be on the right side and it'll, or, and it'll drain into the uh, subclavian vein on the right side, but it only drains the right upper limb and the right neck. So that's an important distinction because it helps you identify the spread of infections. So here on this slide, I'm showing you, and I'll slow down because I don't think you have this slide, uh, showing you these different structures. The thoracic duct here uh, joining in the neck, the subclavian, and we can see that thoracic duct is extending all the way up and down the, uh, the posterior wall of the thoracic cavity. And it's joined by the lymphatic duct from the right side. And you can see how the lymphatic duct is draining the left side of the body, these intercostal spaces, as well as the neck and the left or the right uh, limb, and then joins up with a thoracic duct in the uh, thoracic uh, cavity. And uh, this fluid is also uh, draining up from the lower portion of the body, being collected uh, here in the cisterna chile, which is just an enlargement of the thoracic duct. Uh, to travel this lymph fluid, eventually travel up and rejoin the vasculature. Here in this view, we can also see some of the posterior uh, venous drainage structures, the azygous vein and the hemiazygous vein. The azygous vein is on the right side of the thorax. Hemiazygous is on the left side. There's also a small accessory hemiazygous that's draining uh, the superior portion of the left side of the thorax. So hemiazygous is on the left side. Accessory hemiazygous is a small one on the left side uh, superiorly. Vagus nerve, phrenic nerve. We already know these things. Of course, they're traveling through the neck to get into the vasculature because we know vagus nerve, parasympathetics for all the visceral organs down to the uh, left uh, splenic flexure 
of the colon, phrenic nerve, uh, uh, you know, diaphragm. <clears throat> Uh, sympathetic chain, we're going to see that traveling down. So that is the um, postganglionic uh, neural cell body for the sympathetic uh, chain. And that travels up and down the vertebral column. So the preganglionic sympathetic neuron is located in the IML in the thoracic uh, spinal cord. But the postganglionic neuron is located up and down the complete a body uh, through the entire vertebral column. And then, of course, we're already familiar with the scalenes as they attach to the first rib, the brachial plexus uh, coming out through them. So now let's look at the diaphragm. The diaphragm has a number of different components, uh, and its purpose is to expand the thoracic cavity to draw air into the lungs, to expand the space inside the lungs, to create a low pressure area in the lungs, and that low pressure area is uh, relieved by the inflow of air uh, through your trachea uh, to fill the lungs caused by that low pressure. Then the, um, to exhale, the diaphragm is relaxed, uh, allowing that air to, you know, close, shrink, uh, decreasing the space inside the thoracic cavity, expelling air. So that's the function of, so primary respiratory muscle. So a lot of us tend to use are accessory muscles for respiration, and that causes a great deal of uh, back pain and posture problems, neck stiffness, uh, all of these things. Um, uh, so it's important for you to observe your patient's breathing characteristics, to watch for the inflation of their belly, to see that they're breathing down into their belly, uh, because that can be the cause of uh, some symptoms of back pain and, and things like that. Uh, so this is an important muscle to train your patients to activate specifically. Uh, so moving on, mentioning the different portions, there's a central tendinous portion to the diaphragm where it's just connective tissue, no musculature, and a surrounding muscular portion. Uh, the muscular portion is attached to uh, the, uh, the vertebrae posteriorly by what are called crura. There's a right crus and a left crus. Collectively, there are crura. There are also uh, holes, foramen and hiatuses within the diaphragm that allow the passage of things like the, uh, the aorta, the vena cava, the esophagus, things that have to go from the thor thorax into the abdomen. So, of course, activation of phrenic uh, causes that uh, central tendon to lower uh, causing the lungs to expand, low pressure, air goes in. Uh, so <clears throat> the, um, the diaphragm is mainly supplied by C345, the phrenic nerve, but there are also intercostal nerves uh, that we just talked about, and these run very, very close to the inferior thoracic aperture where the diaphragm is attached. And in so doing, they can cross over and supply uh, sensory innervation, not muscle innervation, but sensory innervation to the diaphragm. So uh, phrenic nerve does most of the sensory, it does the motor, but the, um, we also have some sensory from the intercostals. It's, um, when do I want to talk about this? So the blood supply, okay, so yeah, sure. So the blood supply of uh, the phrenic muscle, the diaphragm, is supplied by a number of different things. Internal thoracic artery gives off branches. It gives off a pericardiophrenic branch, which travels around the heart uh, to the lateral portions of the diaphragm. It also has a musculophrenic portion, a branch. Uh, that supplies the anterior portion of the heart. The posterior portion, uh, not the heart, the diaphragm. The posterior portion of the diaphragm is supplied by the uh, superior phrenic arteries traveling directly branching from the abdominal aorta. Uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's branching in the thoracic cavity. Most of the time, actually, it's probably branching in the thoracic cavity, but sometimes in dissection, it's easier to see from the abdominal view. So, uh, the inferior portion of the diaphragm is supplied by the inferior phrenic artery. Uh, what's interesting about phrenic nerve, because it has sensory components, 
and because it's traveling around the heart, is that it can sense uh, expansion or um, irregular beating patterns within the heart. And those are that, so the sense of a heart attack is caused by phrenic nerve detecting the uh, activity in the pericardial sac around the heart. And so that manifests uh, as, um, as pain in the shoulder because those sensory neurons from the visceral phrenic nerve are synapsing on C345, nucleus proprius substantia gelatinosa uh, neurons to sense the pressure and pain uh, in that region. So that's this referred pain, and that's why uh, pain in the visceral portions of your body is referred to the peripheral portions of the skin dermatomes of your body. So we don't have internal dermatomes. All of our internal senses are mapped onto our external dermatomes, and this is an example of that uh, mapping caused by a visceral type of, uh, you know, a nerve that's located viscerally. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, let's look at these uh, foramen and hiatuses. Of course, we have uh, the vena cava traveling through the diaphragm, so it's got its hiatus or foramen uh, at T8. We have the esophagus at about the level of T10, and we have the aortic hiatus in the posterior between the crura at about T12. And you can see all of the things that travel through. So, uh, at, the, uh, so at the esophageal hiatus, of course, the vagus nerve is at this point traveling with the esophagus to supply the abdominal GI tract. And so that's its purpose. So it also travels through the esophageal hiatus. The aorta, um, behind the aorta is the azygous vein, so no big deal there, and the thoracic duct behind the aorta. So it makes sense that those are there as well. Uh, we also have some of the hip flexors, the psoas major uh, and the quadratus lumborum, uh, located in the posterior abdominal wall uh, behind the thorax. So those will do those functions. That's all I've got for the thoracic wall. Uh, so I hope that was a, a nice, relaxing, uh, easy-to-comprehend lecture. See you next time.